Um, so I want to talk about um, a couple of things, but broadly this is about IoT and the Internet of Things. Um, wanted to uh, just very briefly highlight the uh, center we have at uh, UC Viterbi that looks at cyber physical systems and the Internet of Things. Uh, and one way of thinking about the sort of very um, broad effort is to connect horizontal technologies with vertical applications. Certainly all of us gathered here uh, are looking at sort of these uh, applications in the, in the building space and uh, Virgin um, and her colleagues are, are uh, really leading um, another center that's really focused on that uh, particular area that we're all here to discuss. Uh, but there's sort of been this vision of IoT uh, in the air at least for 10 years um, that our cities will get smarter, our buildings will be smarter, there'll be sensors everywhere talking to um, you know, computers and machine learning will uh, make everything smarter, we'll all be in this uh, utopia. Uh, but it's, it's been more or less the same talk for a long time, right? Uh, and uh, as some colleagues and I uh, sat down to think through what are some inhibitors of adoption of uh, technology, uh, to what extent is this, are we missing the technology, are we missing some other pieces, uh, what is the source of, of real uh, challenge and complexity here? Um, we came to kind of thinking about um, some of the complexity that's inherent in boundaries that exist when you deploy technology at a large scale. These are boundaries that have to do with organizational boundaries. You're typically, unlike in a lab environment, not deploying this technology within a very uh, sort of unified, single organization type of environment. Uh, even if you talk about a building, there can be the owners of the building, there can be the users of the building, there can be the managers and operators, there may be people that go in and out. Um, and so organizationally, it's not unified. Uh, you can see uh, potentially some of the interactions happening around the system cross economic boundaries. Uh, they may cross trust boundaries. Do I trust you with uh, my sources of data uh, to do some computation and inference on? And what is my incentive to, to let you do that? Um, you know, related privacy concerns uh, in, in many cases. Uh, there can be, of course, technology boundaries. I have you know, device of type A, you have device of type B. For whatever reason, they don't talk to each other. Um, uh, disciplinary boundaries that uh, we're all here to uh, cross in, in our conversations today. There can be cultural boundaries around everything from kind of there's an engineering piece to this to a business piece and a, and a kind of, um, you know, the use case uh, that, that you're envisioning. All of these might have different organizations, entities all involved. And the source of complexity in adoption of technology has to do with all of these different boundaries being there. And so we took uh, a crack at sort of addressing um, or at least starting to address this and, and trying to think about what are some um, areas, particularly within engineering and within the technology space, uh, that at least start to address questions of how do you cross uh, these boundaries more seamlessly, what are some problems there that we might be able to address um, to a limited extent perhaps, but at least uh, begin to address. Um, and, and these are a few uh, that we've been playing with. Uh, one is trying to think about data architecture and networks uh, in ways that promote interoperability and scalability, uh, draw lessons from the way the internet was designed uh, that you know, 40, 50 years ago was not uh, designed necessarily keeping in mind the applications and the network networks we would have today, but we still have the internet more or less architecturally the same. So what, what were some of the ideas there that we could build on? Um, the economics of it, how do you really create incentives for people to deploy uh, IoT at scale? How do you get them to link their components of the system together in ways that are meaningful and incentive compatible from their perspective? Um, security and cryptography have a role to play, uh, particularly when it uh, comes to issues of privacy and trust. Um, and then, you know, kind of on a, on a related vein, distributed systems and distributed ledger technologies are kind of um, trying to create a new layer of trust for uh, distributed applications. So can we leverage some of these ideas uh, going forward? So one effort uh, I want to talk about um, that's been exploring these ideas uh, in the context of IoT um, is called I3, which stands for uh, Intelligent IoT Integrator. And um, it is uh, an effort to create an IoT data marketplace uh, for smart communities. Initially, our efforts have been really uh, motivated by problems in smart cities, but a smart community could even be um, uh, a campus, could be a, a an airport could be a particularly large uh, building as well. 
And um, this is an effort that is inspired by thinking about um, scalability. So um, one kind of essential lesson we can draw from the longevity of the internet is uh, they got one thing right. Uh, and it's this uh, narrow waste architecture. Sometimes we use the phrase, uh, everything runs on IP, IP runs on everything to describe it. So the underlying link layer technologies, physical layer technologies can change. We have Wi-Fi and 4G and 5G, uh, kind of new network technologies coming up, but they don't fundamentally affect how the internet operates because IP sits on top of all of that. Right? So it's able to accommodate those changes below. Likewise, the applications that we're running on top of the internet today were not the ones, perhaps, that were the main use case uh, when uh, ARPANET got started. But because all of that application richness happens on top of IP, and it kind of masks all of the, uh, the changes below, um, you know, we can essentially run these applications on any network. Right? And so it sort of decouples the application end from the network end, and that's sort of perhaps one of the secrets to why we still have the internet that we do. And of course, there's some changes. You know, IP has gone from V4 to V6 to give us a larger address space, but fundamentally, this principle um, has carried us pretty far. So when we look at IoT, we see that architecture could be a challenge. Uh, the way people think about IoT today, uh, what we call IoT 1.0, is still very much application by application. You want to create an IoT network for measuring air quality. You want to create an IoT network for uh, temperature in a building. You want to create an IoT network for traffic sensing. You want to create an IoT system for whatever. Right? Each one of these is saying that you bundle into the same ecosystem or the same application everything from the sensors and actuators to the network, to the software that runs it, to the uh, end user application, all is sort of one vertical side. That's not the way the internet was built, and that's not fundamentally a way we can scale things because you're not able to leverage what might be already available in an environment. So if I have certain sensors deployed for one application, why should I prevent someone who might find conceivably another use for this same sensor data in a different application from having access to it? But if I've kind of locked them into a separate proprietary application deployed by one company that doesn't talk to a different application I might want to deploy in the same building, all of a sudden, a building isn't, right, uh, it's not just a collection of different applications, one for surveillance and security, one for uh, air conditioning, one for, you know, you name it. So moving from that model to one where you can have devices and device networks contribute data to a common middleware, which we call I3, and applications connect to this middleware to be able to collect data that they need uh, in order to, to operate. And the idea is that you may not have thought of every possible device or um, network you might want to deploy in this environment, in this community, up front. But as they show up, new applications can benefit from their presence. Likewise, not every possible application you can imagine for the smart building needs to have been conceived of in advance, but as they show up, they can um, connect to and pull data as they need. Right? Um, and so this is in contrast with the way a lot of IoT development happens today, which is really still that, that left um, picture. But uh, one subtle difference from IP is that we're talking about doing all of this now at the data layer, not at the level of the network itself. Right? So we're saying there is a common middleware that all of these applications can use to pull uh, data from. Now, if we want to go down this path, however, uh, in a multi-entity type of environment in a community that's not all run by a single administrative entity, there has to be an incentive for someone to provide their data for somebody else's application. Right? And so the idea here is to think about smart communities the way cities have really always been good at uh, allowing people to buy and sell goods and services. We need to be able to do that with data. And so this architecture also has to uh, provide for the economics of uh, data transfer. And it has to do this in a way that is mindful of the ownership of the data. So whoever owns a data source should be able to specify who can have access to that data source, uh, at what time, uh, under what conditions, and maybe even at what price. Right? So how do you kind of build in these notions of incentive, as well as uh, data ownership and privacy into the middleware? These are questions um, we've been exploring. So our way of thinking about this is um, what we call uh, the i3 um, platform. Uh, at its core, it's a marketplace for IoT data, that there might be an operator for that community that runs this marketplace 
you've got uh, devices and device networks that plug in and provide data products to the marketplace. You've got uh, consumers that are application developers coming to this data marketplace, uh, agreeing to conditions imposed by the data owners in order to get access to the data and then be able to build their applications. Um, one example we give in cities is parking. You may have parking data coming from the city, from private garage owners, from streets where there is no uh, parking sensor, but maybe there's a camera you can run machine learning on to infer when spots are available. All of these data sources might be owned by different entities. They provide data products that someone wanting to build a parking application can come to this one marketplace as a one-stop shop, agree to paying for all those streams of data, and then build an application that uses uh, this, this multitude of information. Uh, we have actually built a prototype uh, of i3, and there's a kind of a website front end and a, a PubSub broker uh, at the back. These are some kind of screenshots of what that might look like. Essentially, you define what your data product uh, is that you want to enable access to, um, and whatever conditions you want to impose, and when the buyer essentially agrees to all of that, they have access to the real-time streams of data that your devices are producing, or give actuators provide you provide them with access to your actuators. Um, we've been developing it, um, not just as a pure kind of research study uh, to publish papers on, uh, but working closely with the city of LA, and in fact, more recently, also city of Long Beach, uh, in the county of LA, um, and many, many uh, organizations, both nonprofits, universities, and companies, uh, to really define the use cases for particularly a smart city type of an environment uh, where we can um, kind of do some early deployment and testing of, of these ideas. And we're um, uh, hoping to have a, a demonstration and conference in August as well as a release of the first version of i3 uh, as open source software by the end of the year. Um, just very, very briefly, uh, I mentioned um, you know, blockchains, for example, uh, and related to the topic uh, earlier as well. Uh, we've also been exploring how to enable micropayments for sensor data baked into the application protocols. So instead of HTTP, which only understands asking for data and getting data, uh, building a whole protocol that understands the notion of paying for that data as well as part of the, uh, the, the protocol definition. Uh, other work we're doing is looking at how do you do encryption not only of data but also computation. So if I have to offload my data somewhere uh, in order for it to be processed at a third party um, edge or, or cloud server, can I be guaranteed or have the peace of mind that they're not able to look at my data when they run the computation? and bringing these ideas also to an IoT environment where you're subscribing to not just raw data, but computations over that data in a way that you have the peace of mind that third parties you don't want to have actually look at the data are not able to do that. Uh, and so there's some sort of cutting edge um, uh, cryptography that we're also exploring in that context. So I think I'll stop with that and I'm happy to uh, take some questions about, uh, about all of this. In particular, i3.uc.edu will tell you more about um, this particular effort.